So I'm going to try to set the theoretical stage um, for the more technical experimental talks that will follow directly after me. So what I want to try to tell you is why I think axions could be the next big discovery uh, in physics. Um, so for me, there's three central motivations for thinking about axions. When I say axions today, I just mean the QCD axion. There are other types of axions. We've already heard about other types of axions. But in this talk, we're just going to focus on the QCD axion. So the original motivation for the QCD axion comes from something called the strong CP problem. I'll explain to you what that problem is. But it was later realized axions could also make up the dark matter of the universe. So I'll also tell you why that is. And then more recently, it's become understood that axions are a generic prediction of string theory and that they're actually deeply embedded uh, within the framework of quantum gravity. And I'll give you some sense for why that is also. And it's not just that axions are extremely well motivated. Um, we also have a good chance of actually being able to detect them in the laboratory or in astrophysics. Uh, I will make the statement that I think that axions could be ruled out or detected within 15 years. But it's really up to the people in this room to make that happen. We have the ideas to make this happen. We have the technologies to make this happen. But we need people to actually make this happen. And uh, at least two of these collaborations that are trying to make this happen are represented in this room today. And this is part of a much broader effort going on around the world, uh, which I will uh, also try uh, to hint at. And uh, I think whenever, more broadly, when we ask what is a compelling framework for physics beyond the standard model, we should ask the question, is the null hypothesis interesting? If we look for something and we don't see it, uh, will that result be interesting? And in the case of the axion, I think there's the definitive answer to that question is yes. Uh, this is a, a no-lose uh, place to look for new physics. If we see it, amazing. If we don't see it, that brings up a lot of deep questions that we would have to grapple with in fundamental particle physics. So uh, before I get started, just to orient everybody, uh, let me talk briefly about energy scales in particle physics just to get us all on the same page. So the lowest mass but non-zero mass particle that we have in the standard model are the neutrinos with masses on the order of milliEV, 10 milliEV. Going up in mass, we get to the electron, the proton. There's a whole zoo of particles leading all the way up to the top quark, which is the most massive known particle. Going beyond this in energy scales, everything becomes speculative. We expect that the electroweak force and the strong force unify into a force called the grand unified force at a scale of around 10 to 16 GeV. I'll be referring to this gut scale throughout this talk. And then going up higher in energy, we expect that these forces unify with gravity and some scale around the Planck scale, around 10 to 19 GeV. So axions, if they exist, would be associated with physics that's generated at an extremely high scale. For example, the scale of the grand unification. That, that is, axions would be born at this energy scale. And I'll give you an example precisely what I mean by an axion being born at a certain energy scale. But due to symmetries, axions are ultralight. If they exist, they would be the uh, least massive particle uh, in nature. And due to symmetries, in fact, the higher the scale at which the axion is born, the lower the mass uh, of this axion. So now uh, let's talk about the theoretical motivations for the axion. So the original motivation for the axion is the strong CP problem. And I want to explain this problem to you. Many of you might be familiar with this, but let's just get everyone on the same page. And I'll describe it as the puzzle of the neutron electric dipole moment, which I'll start to explain to you by, uh, by looking at water, where there is no such problem. So water looks a lot like a neutron. It's electrically neutral, but there's some charge asymmetry which means there should be an electric dipole moment pointing in the direction of that charge asymmetry, which would cause, for example, the water to process in an electric field. So we can calculate or estimate the magnitude of the electric dipole moment of water. It's roughly equal to the charge which is separated, about one electric charge, the distance of separation, the size of water. We multiply these uh, two numbers together. We estimate an EDM of around 10 to the minus 8 E centimeters, which matches within a factor of two data. So that's great. Let's know, now zoom in on our nucleus, which has protons and neutrons. I want to focus on the neutron because it looks most similar to water since it's charge neutral. 
Indeed, it looks a whole lot like water because not only is it charge neutral, it's composed of charged constituents. So it's composed of the up and down quarks, which are themselves charged. So you might expect there to be an electric dipole moment, which points in the direction of that charge asymmetry, which would cause the neutron to persist in presence of electric fields. So more precisely, there is a fundamental parameter of nature in the standard model, which is called theta. A fundamental parameter is something like Newton's gravitational constant or the electron mass. It is a property of our universe which cannot change. It is what it is, um, and it cannot evolve. You can think of this fundamental parameter here as an angle, which I'll call theta. And you can envision this angle as the asymmetry angle between the quarks and the neutrons. That's not precisely what it is in quantum field theory, but you can imagine this picture in your head. Such that if theta is non-zero, there is a neutron electric dipole moment. But if theta is precisely zero, then by symmetry, there would be no neutron electric dipole moment. So if theta is non-zero, which is generic, the neutron would persist in the presence of electric fields. If theta is identically zero, then by symmetry, the neutron would not persist in the presence of electric fields. So now let's estimate the magnitude of the neutron EDM, just doing what we did for water. So again, there's about one electric charge separated. Now we have a femtometer, roughly the size of a neutron. We multiply these numbers together. We'd estimate about 10 to the minus 13 e centimeters. If you actually do the calculation in QFT, it turns out this appears at one loop. So there's some pi's, which appear in the denominator, some coupling constants. It's roughly the same, but it's a little bit smaller by a few orders of magnitude. And it's proportional to this theta parameter, at least it's small theta, by symmetry. But now here's the confusing part. You look at data, and data tells us that this theta parameter is tuned to 0 at the level of at least one part in 10 billion. And this is the strong CP problem. So in particular, theta is an angle which could have taken values from minus pi to pi. If I create a universe, I randomly draw a value of theta. And that value needs to be at least one part in 10 billion away from 0. So here, I'm making a universe. OK, that one doesn't look like our universe. I need to do this again. I need to do this at least 10 billion times to find, to on average, find a universe which looks anything like uh, the universe that we live in. This is an example of what in physics we call a, a fine tuning problem. And fine tuning problems are great because they often give an indication that something deeper and more fundamental is going on. And uh, these very smart people in the late 1970s proposed something deeper that could be going on. So what they notice is that when we randomly draw a value of this theta parameter, the neutron really wants to push it to 0. That is, the neutron would be in a lower energy field configuration if theta could evolve down uh, to 0. But it can't. It's a fundamental parameter of nature. It doesn't make sense for it to evolve. So what they did was they promoted it to a dynamical field. That field is the axion field. Now, when the axion minimizes its potential, at its minimum, there is no neutron electric dipole moment, thereby solving the strong CP problem. So the picture that emerges is that neutron doesn't just have quarks and gluons. It also has the axion. And the axion, its job is to zero out this neutron electric dipole moment. So uh, getting towards the language of quantum field theory, at a diagrammatic level, the axion interactions are uh, those up in the top left. So the axion interactions with the gluons, these are the ones that are responsible for zeroing out the neutron electric dipole moment. But then there are loop diagrams, since gluons talk to quarks, and quarks talk to photons, you induce at the quantum level interactions of axions with photons. These are unavoidable. And those interactions are the ones that we're going to use today in the laboratory that you're going to hear about in the talks after mine, because they allow incoming axions to, for example, in the presence of laboratory magnetic fields, convert into photons. And also, these sorts of diagrams induce interactions between axions and quarks, uh, which people also try to use in the laboratory. So at a more precise level, the interaction of uh, this theta parameter, which, which uh, parameterizes the neutron electric dipole moment, is given by the following term, which could have appeared in the QCD Lagrangian, where G here is the QC field strength. This would generate a neutron electric dipole moment proportional to this theta parameter. The axion solution is we promote theta to a dynamical field, the axion. There's a scale FA, which I already hinted at before. This is the scale at which the axion is born. And I'll tell you again what that means in a few slides, what it means for the axion to be born at some scale. And now in the presence of this axion field, the expected neutron electric dipole moment is 0. 
And due to these quantum effects, the axion also acquires in the infrared an interaction with electromagnetism, which looks like a u dot b. So more precisely, what happens is that the, this term, in the presence of non-perturbative QCD effects, you get a contribution to the axion potential. And when the axion minimizes its potential, it zeroes out the neutron electric dipole moment. This is just the mathematical version of that picture that I showed you before. But now if you expand this potential, you'll see there's a quadratic term in the axion, which gives you a mass for the axion. And as I mentioned before, that mass is inversely proportional to this scale FA, such that if FA becomes larger, the mass becomes smaller. So if we take, for example, a benchmark of FA at the gut scale, we get a mass of around a nano EV. So we're going to be looking for ultralight particles. So this is the space that we're going to be living in throughout all the experimental talks that we hear today for the axion. This is the space we primarily talk about because we're usually talking about photons. So here I'm focusing on the following term in the axion Lagrangian, the interaction of axions with electromagnetism. And I'm parameterizing it by coupling g a gamma gamma. That coupling is inversely proportional to the decay constant, although there's some model dependence which can enter in there. So the axion photon coupling is inversely proportional to the decay constant. As I mentioned, the mass is inversely proportional to the decay constant. So the mass and the coupling are proportional to each other. And indeed, for the QCD axion, the mass and the coupling are expected to lie on this line. So the only part of this parameter space that you should care about today, or at least in my talk and the next two talks, are the part along this yellow line. That's where the QCD axion can live. People, of course, look for axions elsewhere, but those are not the QCD axions. Those are not the ones that we're going to be talking about today. So now let me give you some sense of uh, how axions emerge in the context of quantum gravity and string theory. And in this context, what does it mean for an axion to be born at some energy scale? So in string theory, axions are generic. And they're generic because of two crucial ingredients. One is extra dimensions. And two is the presence of gauge fields. Gauge fields are things like electromagnetism. So let's imagine a toy example where we have electromagnetism living in a five-dimensional theory. But one of these dimensions is compactified on a circle of some radius r. So we have 4D Minkowski space, and we have one extra circle compact with radius r. I have a gauge field, for example, electromagnetism living in the five-dimensional theory with some index m, which can take our normal values 0, 1, 2, 3, but also can take values in this fifth dimension. So the component of this gauge field along the fifth direction, more specifically an integral along, around the circle of A5, behaves like an axion from the point of view of that four-dimensional effective field theory. And the decay constant of that axion is inversely proportional to the size of the circle. So this is what I mean when I say an axion is born with some, uh, at some energy scale and acquires a decay constant at some energy scale. In this case, that energy scale is the size of the extra dimensions that give rise to the axion. OK, so now we've talked about two motivations for the axions. They can solve the strong CP problem. They emerge generically in the context of string theory. But it turns out they can also explain the dark matter in our universe. How does that uh, come about? Well, when we think about axions as dark matter, first we use very different language than we, for example, talk about WIMPs as dark matter, simply because axions uh, have a really, really small mass. So when we talk about WIMPs as dark matter, we use the language of particles, because what we measure in astrophysics is the amount of mass within some volume. So if we make the masses of these particles smaller and smaller, we need to pack more and more particles into that volume. Axions are bosons. So we can pack as many as we want. And as we make the mass smaller and smaller and smaller, going towards axions, eventually the quantum wave functions of these particles will overlap and will change uh, to, the, to having a classical description of this ensemble of particles. So when we talk about axion dark matter, we use the language of classical fields. So now we have this classical field, the axion field. We need to include it in our equations of motion in the early universe. Here, dots are time derivatives. H is the Hubble parameter in the early universe. We can solve this differential equation. And what we find is that in the early universe, going through cosmological time, at early times, the axion is frozen at its so-called misalignment angle, which I'm denoting here by theta i, until Hubble drops to the mass. After this point, 
the axion field is oscillating, like a damped harmonic oscillator, and it's non-trivial, but you can check it, that after this point, the coherent oscillations of the axion field behave like dark matter for astrophysical purposes, making it a viable dark matter candidate. That doesn't mean you get the correct abundance of dark matter. For that, you need to carry out the rest of the calculation. And you'll find you get the correct dark matter abundance for very, some very specific value of the decay constant. On the other hand, that is only true in the scenario in which the axion is born before inflation in some sense. If it's born after inflation, if I go to disconnected Hubble patches, they should see different initial values of the axion field, different misalignment angles. But in the subsequent evolution of our universe, all of those different Hubble patches come into causal contact with each other. And so our co-moving horizon today should include some average over those histories. And there are topological defects known as axion strings, which develop. Actually, simulating this cosmology is difficult. This is a big focus of my group. Let me just show you one animation of our axion string cosmology. You can see these strings wiggling around here. They emit bursts of axion radiation. The, that axion radiation goes on to become the dark matter of our universe. So we run these simulations. We count all of the particles which are emitted. These are complicated situ simulations because these strings are very narrow, um, but they're also very long. So we use an adaptive mesh, uh, which you can see here, in order to uh, resolve the relevant uh, length scales. So here you can see our finest uh, uh, resolution. OK, so all of this to say that there are two, in my mind, preferred mass ranges for the axion to live. Up here is the range where we find that axion dark matter is most naturally explained. On the other hand, you can also argue, and this is something we've argued recently in my group, that string theory actually prefers a lower mass range. Because when you go up in mass in string theory, you start to run into issues of proton decay. So this does not mean that string theory can't explain axions here, or that dark matter couldn't be explained down here. But in both cases, it's slightly non-trivial. So in my mind, what we need to be doing at an experimental level is looking over this entire parameter space. But there's something non-trivial that we're going to learn, no matter where the axion shows up. So I want to quickly bound this parameter space to set the stage for the experimental talks in minus one minutes. So down here and up here, the parameter space is bounded from astrophysical constraints. And there's some hope, you can ask me afterwards uh, for details, of probing this upper end of the mass parameter space with astrophysics, in particular looking for axions from supernova. This is something I'm involved in, happy to talk about it later. But over most of this parameter space, we need to do laboratory experiments. ADMX is the only experiment to date to have probed part of this parameter space, but there's a whole host of experiments, two of which we'll hear about today, PXS and Alpha, which are probing interesting parts of this space. And there are ideas uh, for getting down to these lower uh, regions of axion mass, some that I'm involved in, and some that we're also trying to uh, pursue at Berkeley, which I'm happy to discuss. So in my mind, axions are the best motivated chance for new physics. There's a clear path forward for discovery, but we need to invest uh, in the science in order for that uh, to uh, in order for that discovery to come about. So thank you. Thank you, Ben.